Underrated movie lovers, welcome back. We missed you. And you missed it! This is episode 9, the Talk Radio Edition. I'm your host this time around, Alex, and with me are the usual suspects, Jack, Ryland, Zach, and Andrew. We are on Facebook, You Missed It? Question mark. SoundCloud, You Missed It? Podcast. Twitter, at YMI underscore podcast. YouTube, You Missed It? Question mark podcast. And iTunes. Yeah, we got an iTunes. <laughs> uh, sorry, I mean YouTube, so that's awesome. Special thanks to The Vitos for allowing us to use their song, Car Trouble. You can find them on SoundCloud at The Vitos, V-I-D-O-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at The Vitos Band, all one word, and their official website, thevitosmusic.com. Special shout out to my friends, Brody and Nick. They do the Jabroni Jabber podcast, which you can find on Facebook and Twitter at Jabroni Jabber PC, all one word, and on SoundCloud at Jabroni Jabber Podcast. They discuss all things classic wrestling with some current events mixed in. I watched wrestling for a short time back in the day from about 1997 to 2001. That's very specific. That's the attitude right there. Yes. <laughs> that was me too. Yeah. Yeah. That was a bit after. And thanks to my longtime friends, Corey and Trevor Turner, for getting me into that. Topics that Brody and Nick have discussed in the 12 episodes they've done so far include Hulk Hogan, Jake the Snake Roberts, Sting, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Attitude Era, theme songs, Brody and Nick's love of wrestling, and why the current era of wrestling sucks. Well, they're right on yeah. all that. Yeah, that's pretty good. I kind of like that. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, I, gotta, I gotta listen to that. That's... The, the extent to which my wrestling knowledge, is, the, ex, the extent of my wrestling knowledge is any wrestling game that ever came out from the 90s until now. Mm. <laughs> or when you had to wrestle that raccoon in the backyard or that, that one time. Yeah, that, that, mm. was, that was me and wrestling. Yeah. My yeah. relationship to wrestling. Yeah, yeah no, I've, I've went out of it in the mid to late 2000s a bit. Like, I stopped watching like 05 and then picked up on a little bit now lately so i'm kind of back into it and yeah there's some issues mm-hmm. <laughs> with this uh generation of storytelling and how it's done so yeah no absolutely yeah good that yeah. sounds like a good show and now to this week's film talk radio stars eric bogosian ellen green leslie hope john c mcginley pardon me john c mcginley alec baldwin john pankow and michael wincott among others It centers on a Dallas, Texas radio talk show host named Barry Champlain. Fast-talking, sometimes foul-mouthed, quite often funny, and always provocative. Barry's late-night show, called Night Talk, is about to be picked up for national syndication. And the stress he has to deal with from the many callers to the show, as well as the watchful eye from the VP in charge of advertising at Metro Wave Broadcasting, a giant media corporation, has flown in from Chicago to watch Barry in action, and this prompts him to call his ex-wife, who is now remarried, to fly in and be there for him during his time of need. Hilarity, shock, and unease follow as we, the audience, watch Barry do what he does best and what he's known for, with disastrous consequences. Talk Radio was directed by Oliver Stone. Right after this, he directed Born on the Fourth of July, Prior to this, he had directed Wall Street in 1987, Platoon and Salvador in 1986, The Hand in 1981, and Seizure, his directorial debut, in 1974. Budget for this film was an estimated $4 million, and it made approximately $3.4 million. Source on this is the Internet Movie Database, also known as the IMDb. Rating for this movie on the IMDb is 7.3 out of 10, and on Rotten Tomatoes, it has an 82% on the tomato meter. The movie was filmed from April to May 1988 and released in the United States on January 13, 1989, according to the IMDb, or December 21, 1988, according to Wikipedia. The film was actor Eric Bogosian's debut starring role in a theatrical film. He was 34 at the time of filming. People may know him from the TV show Law and Order, Criminal Intent, and movies such as Under Siege 2, Dolores Claiborne, Deconstructing Harry, and Wonderland, to name a few. He also voiced three characters in Beavis and Butthead Do America. 
<laughs> Eric wrote the screenplay with help from director Oliver Stone. The screenplay was almost entirely based on Bogosian's original play of the same name, same name, co-written with Tad Savinar, and some biographical information about Alan Berg, a talk show host in Denver, Colorado, who was murdered in 1984 by white supremacists. The picture was made and released about a year after its source book, entitled Talked to Death, The Life and Murder of Alan Berg, by Stephen Singular, had been first published in 1987. The play Talk Radio was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Actors John C. McGinley, who has been in many Oliver Stone films, and the great Michael Wincott, from movies such as Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, The Crow, and Strange Days, had appeared in the stage play. In his research for the film, Eric Bogosian often watched the on-air production of the Tom Likas talk show, then originating from Los Angeles station KFI. Bogosian's fictional character in this film shares many speech patterns and mannerisms with real-life talker Likas. As a side note, if anyone knows who Dick Masterson and Maddox are, both of them have talked about Tom Likas being an inspiration for them. According to the show business trade paper Variety, quote, known in theatrical circles as a monologist and performance artist, Eric Bogosian debuted the initial incarnation of talk radio in Portland, Oregon in 1985. For the screenplay, he and director Oliver Stone worked in material relating to Alan Berg, the Denver talk show host murdered by neo-Nazis in 1984, and also created a flashback to illuminate their anti-hero's personal background and beginnings in the radio game. End quote. Jack. Oh, hi. <laughs> so, with regards to the film, how did it make you feel? I don't know. <laughs> oh, um, it's such a letdown. <laughs> <laughs> After that huge buildup. Jack's used to that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I have to do one per podcast. Where's that I think I did one Where's last time. Yeah. Oh, I need a soundboard, man. You got one on your phone. Um, no, nah, they're not as fun. I want like a physical soundboard. I want a, really, like, I want a radio the the soundboard in front of me. Well, if we get Wait, enough let's, money. Let's hook us up with the Patreon next day, social media guru, Jack. Well, yeah, like I wanted a button for that that just went, bu -bu -bu -burr. Yeah. He just wants to press buttons, that's all. Well, I can straight. give, him one, like those, I can give way, one of those so. fidget things. You're like, hey, it's a button. You can just click it over and over again. And so you like can imagine it saying, I'm doing yeah. this. <laughs> it's just crazy. Wee, 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 wee. You can get one of those kids' toys or whatever that make like the different noises. Oh, a Bop it. A bop, yeah. it a bop it would be good enough. I actually yeah. have, I, no, I have the bop it that had five. It Shout is. out to bop it, yeah. free advertising. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that, I don't even know the toy's still around. We my should. friend, just a sidebar, unrelated, but my friend used to uh, right. take a bop it whenever it was sitting there, and he would always, uh, he basically, every time it go, you know, it goes like, yeah. bop it, right? Yeah. He would just go fuck it every time. And he would just like, there were like people in the house, and he all you would hear from like a distance is like, fuck it. Fuck it. <laughs> I, yeah, so. Oh anyway, yeah. Anyway, So yeah. that's enough about the bop it. <laughs> Let's return Jack, what did you think? <laughs> um, I, yeah, so um, I have never seen this movie before. I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I went very cold into this one. Uh, I had seen a couple other Oliver Stone films. Uh, he, oh, in fact, wrote my favorite film. Um, but uh, besides the ones that he directed, I had seen Platoon, uh, which I liked. I had seen uh, JFK, which I really liked. Um, I'm blanking on some of his other movies off the top of my head. Oh, yeah, and uh, Any Given Sunday, which I thought was okay. Did you see Wall Street? I never saw Wall Street. That's good. <gasps> um, That's good. No, uh, but I, you know what's funny? I didn't I see Wall Street, Street, but I saw W. Um, oh. <laughs> which is the George Bush one that he yeah. directed, which I actually thought, I thought wasn't bad. I thought actually the cast was really great. Um, but that's a different movie. This movie, Talk Radio. Um, I did really uh, like it. Um, it took me a while to really kind of get into it. Uh, like, what is he? Because I was really gra uh, drawn in by the lead actor. Mm. I thought he was fantastic. He has mm -hmm. a great voice. Mm -hmm. He does sound like South McFarland from time to time. You did a little yeah, bit, yeah. A little I was bit. like having <laughs> that. I, I was like before I saw his face because they do his voice obviously at yeah. the beginning of the mm -hmm. film. 
man i was wondering for a second i was like it can't be but like yeah no, there's no way what <laughs> like it's uncanny mm-hmm. to a certain degree right like at times uh, yeah no I, when he's mostly i guess the, it's just the radio voice though. it is the radio voice yeah. and yeah, yeah. like how like I, I would say when he's more ranting that's where you can see oh i can sort of see, i can hear the mcfarlane isms i would say i would guess mm-hmm. um but yeah no, i thought the cast uh, all around was really good um it's just amazing. The thing that just struck me was like all the talking points. Just it's the same talking points we've been having today. Yeah. And just how this movie came out 29 years ago, and it's crazy, and it's really it's fascinating and almost kind of disheartening at the same time. Uh, so you're like, oh, we're still talking about this. This is still an issue, and they're talking about all the callers. Some of them are talking about like this has been going on for 30 plus years. So you just kind of. It sinks in more that, oh, my God, this all this is still happening. Um, and all the talking points. And it's just, it just keeps, it's a cycle. And I think yeah. the ending of the movie really, really pushes that forward. Like, you know, spoilers um, for those who haven't seen it. But the there's a shooting at the end. And they the movie kind of ends with just a helicopter shot of Dallas and just hearing radio callers just talking about the aftermath about it. And just, just it's just another, it's just how it shows that, like nothing really sticks. It's just a show, you know. the The guy takes it seriously, but everything else is like, no, this is just a show. They're gonna listen to the next one. They're gonna listen to the next one. There's nothing real, you know, concrete about it. But. Yeah, it's like heaven forbid we actually learn something from this. Yeah, and a lot of them is, and they keep, and then like, why do you keep calling if you know you want to complain, 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 or anything like that? So it just shows the madness of the whole idea and system of it. Um, while also showing like the works of it, and I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, no. So overall, I liked it. Excellent. Thank you. So for all you feminists and all you people who are easily triggered, this is your trigger warning. Go to your safe space. Get away from this podcast. Come back in the next thirty seconds. Rylan. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. I. Uh, I As a I'm woman. By that introduction. Yeah. What an introduction. As a woman. How did the film make you feel, especially with regards to how the two female characters were played or written or performed or whatever? Um, I don't know. It's 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 hard to tell. This, well, for me, I was most definitely most engaged by the by the male um, the the male uh, lead actor there. Hmm. Uh, I agree with Jack. He was extremely engaging to uh, to watch and listen to, and the passion that he put into his performance was was great for sure. Um, let's so, okay. So I guess who should I start with? Uh, well, I feel like the producer. Um, we didn't really know that much about her character other than kind of her role and um and uh, barry's character spells it out uh, uh pretty frankly near the beginning it's like we work together and we sleep together and like it's kind of implied that like she she like wants something more out of it which i mean i guess because women are more emotional creatures and we kind of seek the seek that nesting instinct i suppose is what they were trying to say there i guess it was supposed to basically be like oh look she's she's in love with him so he can't be that bad he must he basically basically i think she was just there to kind of highlight his redeeming qualities a little bit more um because the he wasn't doing a very good job of highlighting them himself mind you yeah and especially with regards to how he treats her we we can kind of see how he treated his now ex-wife mm-hmm. pretty much the same yeah it's it yeah it becomes pretty clear like this is not a character who's who's meant to be in a in a serious like uh codependent relationship i don't think he is just i i agree with the the criticism of the character in the movies i think like, he he needs to hear himself talk and uh, he needs somebody there who can provide that validation for him and for a long time that was his ex-wife uh his ex-wife Ellen, who was like all on board and like his cheerleader, but yeah. naturally um, she ended up starting to get to find herself being uh, trying to be helpful and supportive and being pushed away by uh, by uh, her then husband, who was getting uh, consumed in the uh, in his own uh, rising stardom and notoriety and stuff. Yeah. And uh, and I guess. Oh, yeah, and then they try to make it a thing near the end of the movie that she's fallen back in love with him after, like, 
visiting him and being in town for like one day and like and keep in mind like she's remarried at this point too so she like she's away from like her 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 new husband for like a couple of days and and she hears uh her guy uh talking on the radio again and oh oh yeah he's about to go national i guess so maybe there's like she thinks there's possible financial connections in there too but i'm just like girl what's going through your brain right now (laughs) like you need to calm down step back and think rationally here but remember she had visited him visited him before because after he picked her up from the airport they went to a park to talk and she said i can't keep coming back here so she'd been back and forth all right i might have missed that little detail it it's happened it moves pretty quickly it does yeah the dialogue in this movie is just like bam 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 it's definitely like blink and you miss it it's type of material but honestly the writing i think is the star of this movie because it Mm. just it just goes it just keeps going there's long long periods of just unbroken conversation or monologue lots of monologuing as well but it doesn't it doesn't feel slow it doesn't feel boring it doesn't drag like there's constantly just 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 words coming at you and and making you think yeah exactly and that's because it was based on eric's play uh, the great eric bogosian terrific job uh, with a play a play could stretch two or three hours now, obviously, theatrical feature film, you got to compress it. Like, you really got to compress it. So mm-hmm. I think him having performed it from 1985, I don't know how long the, the stretch was, but he knew the material. So I think he knew where and how to compress to make it more effective and mm-hmm. just make it speed along. Because that, that's an hour and 49 minutes, that film. But sitting there watching it, and I've seen it in a few times now, it doesn't feel like an hour 49. Well, it's, it's, it's not really very many scenes like i mean yeah. essentially it's like we're 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 in the we're in like the recording room and then occasionally we have little interludes outside of it but we always end up back to back in there for another long lengthy scene and naturally i mean it's about it's about it's about this guy is the uh barry the radio host it's about him in his element so naturally most of the movie is going to take place there but because we spend so much time in this one spot. I mean, it does have that theatrical element to it for that for that reason, but also it just makes the whole thing go by really quickly. Yeah, yeah. You're not, you're not moving around a whole lot. You're kind of just sitting there going through it with them. Yeah, and that's the thing with a talk show. Like if they're if they were in the booth the entire time, the the movie might fall flat. However, uh, it's just like how Michael Bay had wanted to direct Phone Booth. So his question was, when can we get him out of the booth? And that's answered in this film. We get him out of the booth a few times, but for the majority of the time, he's in the booth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zach. Yes. Different question. Okay. Did this movie blow you away? And if not, how many shots is it going to take? How many shots? Yeah. Are we talking liquor? Yeah. (laughs) Sure. Um, Here's the interesting thing about talk radio is there were definitely sections of the movie that blew me away. I actually really liked the first, I don't know how long it was, maybe 30 minutes. The whole intro of like you getting you into that booth and like him talking and it really gets you into the film. Like, you know, the others have said so far, you're really drawn to the main character. He was fantastic. Uh, I forget the actor's name now. Eric Bogosian. Bogosian, Okay. Um, yeah, he was great, and I thought it was kind of like a roller coaster. It was funny, and it was intense, and it was just kind of taking you all sorts of places. And yeah. he had these little breaks, and he'd come into the booth, and he'd go back, and it was really good. Um, but then when it went to, you know, oh, the show actually ended at the, for that night, and it kind of pulled back, and it was, like, doing flashbacks, and it was doing, mm-hmm. like, you know, meeting his uh, ex-wife and stuff like that. And that kind of pulled me out a little bit. Um, and funny how you had mentioned, like, oh, you know, if they'd kept it in the booth the whole time, it might have fell flat. I think it also could have improved it. I, I think, honestly, in my mind, I was thinking, oh, it's late 80s, you know, almost early 90s. It would have been kind of cool around that time, kind of like what other films are doing, where you kind of keep it in one location Buried. and do really cool stuff with Movies it. like that. Right? Well, that's, like, way later. But, yeah, that idea. Yeah, uh, like well, you're saying, Dogs. like, nowadays. I was right? thinking more like oh, Reservoir you're thinking Dogs, like early earlier. 90s, oh, okay. like late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And I think like it would have been a trend now, right? So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, I was thinking that would have been really cool if they actually kept it going. And it's like this whole roller coaster. And it's like, oh, shit, what's going to happen? And he's getting this stuff in the mail. And it's like, and it played with your expectations and stuff. He was like, it's a bomb. And it's like, it's not really, but it's like, 
you know, still really threatening and mm-hmm. all it's that. A it's still, bomb. yeah, exactly, right. And it's it's really intense. And obviously, the other thing um, that was a little off for me too, obviously, was the very end. But then again, you said it was based on you know, like a real guy. I guess it was partly based on the murder of a radio host in Denver named Alan Berg, who was killed in 1984. Yeah. So so with that, it's kind of like okay, well, that that kind of softens it a little bit. But just for me, I kind of saw it like you know a mile away it's like oh he's gonna get killed like i Mm. i hope that they they don't do that but then it happened and i was like so for i guess for for cinematic purposes i was like oh i kind of saw it coming but uh but other than that though those two things i mean when he was in the booth that's when i was captured the most Mm. for sure when he kind of ran the show and when it was like kind of very chaotic and you had all the different stuff going on. It was it was really really good. Yeah. Um. So overall, like I liked it. I had those couple problems, but other than that, I thought you know the dialogue was great. I thought you know everything in the booth was fantastic, and uh, I love. I the one thing I will say about the flashbacks is I like that hair, <laughs> like that. Like curly hair that was that, that, that's just something out of like an 80s hair hair band oh i love completely. it completely well it's like howard stern like i said oh it, it does, totally yeah. looked like so that iconic. Which, yeah <laughs> but uh yeah so i don't know like i mean the shots is a bit extreme i may have like a shot you know i don't know but mm-hmm. <laughs> just for fun yeah. yeah i will agree with you zach on um I, when that main the main flashback where mm. it cuts to the ex-wife and the husband yeah i will say as a pacing with the movie the movie did just stop yeah yeah and that that was probably in terms of the weakest in terms of pacing because it, it just like oh context when i kind of i don't know if i really needed to see like it was kind of neat seeing how he got started and all that but yeah. I, I felt like you could have flushed those in a different way yep um because mm-hmm. i didn't Absolutely. think they were they weren't not not necessary um, they were fine and it was kind of neat seeing him get in there but it just it was just a one clunk of a scene it was like 15 minutes just right here mm-hmm. and it just sort of like it faded into it not really motivated and then it faded out not really motivated so that was the only thing I would say yeah. pacing wise it just stopped and I think they could have done some of those things I was going to say this too like because they, they, they gave away like you know in the narrative of like oh well he has breaks between his show and stuff like that you could have done some of those things on those breaks if you had a couple more breaks at different times obviously mm-hmm. if you have the whole movie like that you would have to right so you could have like you know tackled those discussions and those characters and stuff during those other breaks mm-hmm. so yeah for sure yeah yeah if you were to have the whole movie in the booth yeah then yes you'd yeah. have to have more breaks so you could fit that in but yeah. because of how the movie was structured yeah with the VP being there, mm-hmm. breathing down his neck, mm-hmm. you've only got so much time for break. So I think they had to get out of the booth and get back to his life because he does have a life. Yes. And it's like his ex-wife said, you have to have a life. Mm-hmm. And his, his life outside of the booth is much slower. Right. So when he gets into the studio, that's where his life is. That's mm-hmm. where you see him be Barry Champlain, mm-hmm. the character that he has inhabited. Yeah. Because his real name is Barry Gold. Mm-hmm. So he became Barry Champlain. That's when he's alive. So it makes sense that you would be engaged when you see Barry at the microphone doing what he does. Yeah. 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 Okay. Lots to think about. Andrew. <clears throat> With regards to your feelings on the film... And how you feel about feelings, and feels in relation to feelings, and how feels feel when you feel them, and the consequences of feeling feelings at the pivotal moment of the feel climax. (laughs) How do you feel about the most feelingest feels of the feels? Please be brief. We have to move on. Uh, Feelsgasm, I think, is the answer to that question. (laughs) Right? Partially correct. You got the word feel in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like that was a little derogatory considering that I, I focus so much on feelings and emotion, but you know, whatever, man. <laughs> I'm, I, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm making fun of myself. The last film that I did. And when we got to you, I asked you like three or four questions and you're like, whoa, I got to unpack that. So I'm basically just making fun of myself at this point. I don't know about that, man. I'm reading into this. Um, (laughs) Looking into his feelings. That's right. I feel too much. It's It's, it's um, begun. It's hit the feels pretty good. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so a lot of what I thought about the movie was 
pretty well hit upon basically uh i agree a, uh quite a bit with that uh flashback sequence i feel like you telling me uh that or uh, say what you're saying earlier that it's uh it was uh, a play originally mm-hmm. Uh, that makes a lot of sense because as soon as you said that, you can see it. Yes, you can. I could see it absolutely. I feel like I've I've noticed this with a lot of different films that I've seen. I think the last one I saw where it was it was totally noticeable was Fences. Mm-hmm. I saw that like a year yeah. ago. I saw a couple of clips, um, then I saw a Fences, and I saw the yeah. play. It's like dead on. Yeah, I oh, watched yeah. it, and I'm like, this is a play. Like you can tell right away. It's like the way that the the dialogue is. It's all very yeah condensed and uh the locations are very minimal it's usually just like some it's always dialogue heavy things like that like things you'd expect and that's what this movie was Mm -hmm. it was basically just all in the same set outside of a few uh you know where they get away from that and the extended flashback which makes a lot more sense in context of a play because it's like oh we need to do the flashback scene we can't keep going back to it. We need to do it like one off. Mm-hmm. I feel like that makes sense in that context. But in in regards to a film, I agree a little bit more with Zach. Mm-hmm. I think that you could have done it in the breaks because his current, the life that he has right now is less interesting than the context that those, that his past life was giving to, to how he is uh, as a radio host right now, like why he acts the way he does. It informs that. Whereas his current life, it felt like uh, it was, it was just, it was context, but it, I, I didn't feel I needed it as much just because, you know, he was, you know, he has shitty relationships, but you'd expect that from a guy who insults people all day. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he, he can't uh, like, it, I feel like what's more interesting is what led to that. Mm-hmm. So that flashback sequence, the, it was too long and it was unceremoniously kind of like dropped in there. You like uh, mm-hmm. fade it, fade into it, and it just felt kind of weird. I don't. I, it's hard to put a finger on it, like how it felt, but it felt off going into it. Well, once they were into it, I was I was into what they were, the context they were providing, mm. but it just felt weird going in and out of it. I don't know why. It just felt long. Mm. Uh, that's the only thing in the movie that felt long, though. Uh, so yeah, I think you could have done it in the breaks. I, he was at his most compelling when he was on the radio. I love that shot where he was just basically venting and it was yeah it was like was doing the 360 yeah. turn mm-hmm. awesome mm-hmm. like great shot um everything he said was uh engaging whether you agreed with what he was saying or you didn't whether you thought he was being an asshole or not it was all entertainment it was all mm-hmm. which is the point of his show i think the part the part of the film that uh gave me the feels i guess if that's what your uh question to me is um was the end honestly like i i like he got shot i agree with zach uh i i thought whoa this is kind of this is kind of like sudden and i kind of expected it Mm -hmm. but the fact that it's based on a a real personality that makes sense so uh it was after that though i like that they added that uh like i probably like this part from what i gather so far the most out of everybody Mm -hmm. or at least out of the ones who watched it for the first time uh, that end sequence in the credits where they were just doing all the callers calling in mm-hmm. and it was adding a lot of context to what his show it was it was showing what his show meant to people you know how it, it's greater impact mm-hmm. uh and you know i i dug what a lot of the people were saying you know like it's uh, it's comfort you know or you know his show was comfort even though i didn't agree with him i i just like to listen to him or you know, it gives something different to each individual person, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just kind of a neat thing to have, I thought. So I, I actually liked that a lot. And it made me think and feel a little bit more than I had previously in the film. Because even though he was touching on touchy subjects, he was kind of just being an asshole all the time. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I was mostly laughing my way through a lot of it, even though there were a lot of serious moments. Mm-hmm. Uh I just felt like he he was such a sarcastic character that I couldn't help but be sarcastic the entire time watching it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I so I mean to kind of sum up, I I liked it a lot actually. I thought it was I thought it was really entertaining, mm-hmm. which is the, what I want from a film like this. Uh, and uh, he they nailed the part they had to nail. He had a really good radio voice, and I think that draws you in. I think you can't help it when you hear a voice like that you're going to get drawn in. It's mm-hmm. just the way it is. Mm-hmm. It's like Morgan Freeman narrating a movie. Yeah. It just works and it draws you in. 
Yeah, no. So the, the really su- good. Yeah, the success of any show, any t- talk show or video show or anything like that, it really does boil down to the person talking, whether or not they can engage an audience, pull them in, regardless of what they're saying. Because you know, I could say something verbatim of what Alex or whomever says, but you're going to get a different. Um, you're going to take something out of it just because of how each person delivers it. Um, and yeah, I, I what you were saying and. I, I agree with you on the ending too with um it kind of sums up what his show is actually about because the whole f- ending uh, climax with him with the 360 shot was him saying i guess he was finally asking what is my purpose what is the point of all this if i'm hearing this from one end and i believe in this what do you all think and then too bad he didn't get to hear it mm-hmm. um but uh yeah no I, I agree with with that with that point for sure yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think a lot of that is because uh, he he doesn't really want to listen. Um, I think that's you notice that throughout the whole movie oh, yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Is that like you know what is the point? Like, what do you all care? What do you all think? He doesn't want to hear what they think. I never. I don't think he ever did. He cuts people off all the time. Mm-hmm. He tells them what they think. He never actually listens at all. Exactly. Like that's not the point he, of his show. So he goes out of his way to find people's buttons so he can go and push them. And exactly. that's his show. Yeah. yeah, he's a shit disturber. That's mm-hmm. basically yeah. what he is. I like the produ- uh, Alec Baldwin, the produ- uh, yeah. producer, the whatever boss. the boss. He was the boss. Just, just, yeah, the boss. He he said uh, he summed it up pretty well. He's like you, like he was saying what everybody's job is, their show, their role. You're the guy who hangs up on people. Yep. That's your job, right? Like we have the shrink, we have the person who listens, we have all of this, right? Mm-hmm. That's your job, and you know he plays it well. Yeah, and I think it was interesting too because um, the the one scene where he was talking to the guy. And he actually does listen to him, the guy who who wants to like rape women. Well, that was like a totally different. That was like too mm. real, you know. Mm. But that's the thing. It was like that showed. It was the first time he actually was taking his caller, yeah, very seriously because you have to. Yeah, but he got scared, yep. mm-hmm. and that was I think the interesting part when he actually finally sat down and listened, and actually took what in. It frightened him, and that's that led to all of a sudden the freak out. Yeah, like it all unraveling. So I think it all of us, it just kind of led to that moment with the ending, with all that was he finally did listen, and he was like, "Oh shit, he can't take this all in because it's when he actually really focuses to, on each caller, and he puts it just becomes too much. It's too heavy. Yeah. yeah, it's too much to deal with all that negativity, all that uh, hate, and everything that like all what his show, the kind of person that his show draws in, he can't actually handle dealing with that all the time. Because nice. who can, right? Yeah, and he's got his own shit to deal. You with. You need black yeah. comedy to be able to deal with this stuff. That's yeah. how a lot of people cope with dark, uh, dark things in life. Right? They'll they'll usually use humor to help alleviate that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sorry, that yeah, climax so. was that <laughs> climax was really great though i mean touching on like that whole you know rape caller or whatever mm-hmm. calling in and then it goes from there and stuff like that and kind of starts his you know little you, bit of a breakdown a little bit his spiral yeah, yeah. like a little bit well, um, it was it was literally spiraling out of control it's right. getting darker and darker too um, well I, yeah. I i like the no like it had like another feels moment where uh where um, that Ralph called. I remembered his yeah. name because uh, it was kind of cool. He just called in. He's like, man, like we're a lot of like, I got beer. I got this. Like, yeah, come yeah. over. I'm here. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm here for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Whatever, man. And then you could see him pause and like be like, it's nice to have somebody out there who's just kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm here for you, man. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. Like, I, I get you. Mm-hmm. Like, sometimes people just need to hear that. And mm-hmm. in that moment, he kind of seemed like he needed to hear that. So. Yeah, like it was, it was very much a roller coaster again. Like that's the way I would describe. Like when he's in the booth, it's very much up and down. It's like hitting you with a joke, and then it's like dead serious, and it's not in any sort of pattern like that either. It's like you'll have a bunch in a row that are funny, or a bunch that are serious, and then you know it's it's kind of all over, which I really enjoyed quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing about being the lead man in that kind of entertainment format. Mm-hmm. You take whatever comes at you, mm-hmm. and you have to have kind of a business mind with it too yeah the instant you get the call you think where can i go with this how can i make it interesting should i cut them off should i allow them to get a few words in and then sometimes you'll let them go and the caller will say something that you'll pick up on and as an entertainer who's been in the business for a while you will know exactly where to go with even just one word that they say yeah and he was he was a shit disturber, Andrew. Absolutely, he was. Yeah, he's and a classic agitator for sure. He's what 
kids nowadays would call a troll. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. Just, he riles up the people. And in riling up people, he gets more people to call in, and then he agitates them, and he gets even more people to call in who are agitated because of that. it's a self-perpetuating cycle. Yeah. So he's he's keeping his job, and he's fighting for his job night after night. So there's there's a stress in knowing that, but there's also a kind of a relief in taking out your anger and your feelings on people, but also talking out how you feel, especially when it comes to the various topics that people call in with. It's therapy for him, kind of like, because he can get all mad and riled up, Mm -hmm. and then he can sit back and listen to someone. But he always has to think kind of like a businessman. Yes, he has a boss, he has a producer, he has Stu, the guy who's fielding the calls, so he's got all these people he has to interact with to keep his his show rolling the way he wants it to. But you got to think, where can I go with this? I feel like Stu did a terrible job. Like, his job is call screener. Yeah. Like, (laughs) dude, like, first of all, he let a rapist on the line. Like, you heard him, like, screening that call. Like, he, he said this would be a better call for like something else or he didn't believe it or he didn't take the time to like, he let a criminal on the air, like a guy who's like mentally ill on the air, which is kind of like the biggest no, no, uh, even by like, you could tell even by his, uh, you know, Barry standards, it's like, no, this is too far. Like Mm -hmm. we need, this is serious. You Mm -hmm. know, this is a criminal matter. This is like people's lives in danger. This is immediate. So like he man like I feel like he just like let even boring people on like you could say like his job mm-hmm. is to put people who provoke on which sure but he's also putting like these boring people on he's putting it seems like he's just putting whoever calls immediately on yeah the so, the, the thing is though is what that, does Stu like, do I thought I thought about that too but then again I don't know if Barry really has a line you know like I think originally I think because they even warned him at times like oh I don't know if this is such a good call and he's basically just like he's trying to say put him on everything. put him on throw it at yeah. me yeah. it's good it's good you know, radio Stu's shows job, right right I mean if you have <laughs> a guy like that that you're working like for you could just, just kind of throw it at me yeah you could have had the producer just let people like hit yep. a, throw calls to people that, that is it. true but well, yeah that's it's also because of Barry like the, he wouldn't be able to just say no like this isn't coming through I guess but like like, I, yeah. I can't imagine he screened one call. Like, he said no to one call. There, uh, previous, I think, previous to the two nights that we saw him do on the radio, the relationship between Barry and Stu was pretty good. Remember, um, Stu had said to Barry's current girlfriend, you're not his wife, but I am. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the relationship between Barry and Stu. I yeah. think most of the time the calls that Stu fields and throws to Barry, they're pretty good. Like the the guy in the wheelchair, I think his name was Bob. Yeah. And they would do all the old cliche lines back yeah. and forth. Yeah, like he's like a regular caller. Yeah, he he's calls a regular caller. Yeah. yeah, that's just a softball call to throw at him to keep the show going. So maybe it's to like change his mood and stuff, throw this kind of call at him, throw that kind of call at him to like throw something lighter mm-hmm. uh, to balance out the heavy thing he just got. Or something Sometimes. Like that. Uh, remember, the VP is there. So that's oh, putting a lot of pressure on that too, he, He's yeah. trying to deal with that. He's trying to see maybe the two. Maybe of I'm them, not giving Stu enough credit. I don't think you are. Yeah. I think the two of them may have had some bad blood recently, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Stu's throwing these. these these curveball like, calls at him. Yeah, he's like, fuck you, take this call. Let's see what you <laughs> yeah. do with this. Yeah, burn yourself on the air in front of the VP. Fine, I don't care. But the the relationship between those two, for the most part, is pretty good. I think they have a good on-air and off-air rapport. They seem to have a good relationship. I yeah. don't doubt yeah. that. But yeah. it's a relationship. That's the exact thing. It's a yeah. relationship. I think you see do. that a lot, though, right? Like, uh, I'll, take it, I'll take it to... Uh, to uh, a classic Frasier uh, you look at you know <laughs> yeah. Frasier yeah, that know relationship Frazier. that kind yeah. of thing right so like yeah you need to have a relationship with that person like because that's so integral to your show that mm-hmm. that role is so integral to any talk show because what they do uh, impacts whether your show is good or not they are I, like now that I think about it yeah you're right like it, it is it matters a lot that relationship does matter a lot and any radio show that you see whether it's Frasier whether it's a movie like this or anything that has talk radio uh, or or any where you get to see inside a radio station you notice that that's a very important role 
and that's not just in in radio although we saw that in in here tv as well yeah. uh tv in the entertainment industry period i had read that eric bogosian and director oliver stone they had some creative differences while making this film because okay. it's Oliver Stone, he can be an intense guy. Like, he yeah. goes all over no. the place with his topics. No. No, no. I don't know Oliver much about Stone's Oliver Stone. Intense. I think the only other Oliver Stone movie, like, you could name some that I might have seen, but out of all the ones Jack mentioned, mm -hmm. I think I saw Platoon and he, I've seen yeah. Wall Street. You should see JFK, the director. JFK is JFK. awesome. JFK, it, JFK is, yeah. a, regardless, yeah, so I don't know much about regardless if you agree with the subject matter of JFK. Oh, yeah. As a movie, it's fantastic. Yep. And I mean, I don't like Kevin Costner, and that's like the the one movie, you know? That's the movie. Really? You that didn't I'm like Kevin like, Costner I hope as, you uh, die. as uh, Papa Kent? Nope. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> I, did, I, yeah, I did want to kind of add on to what Andrew was saying um, about Stu. I would also take into account that maybe Stu doesn't have the best judgment, given the fact that yeah. he was laughing and giggling in that flashback scene. He was. Um, acting with uh, Barry, with uh, having an affair and all that, so I don't yeah. think he he has the best moral judgment no. uh, way of dealing with things. So I think, oh yeah, we can have this on, no big deal. It's just you can see all in their faces with that one call, and they're like, oh shit, like get this off now. Yeah, like whoops, like yeah, yeah. like they're kind of yeah. Both it seemed in the like same... he made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like he even realized because he had that sign right. He was yeah. like, mm -hmm. like. Yeah, and the other, and he looked at him like this is real. Like he mouthed, "This is real." Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You were probably right. Mm -hmm. Like that was a fuck up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, uh, I, I I like that actor a lot. It's nice seeing yeah. him. In the... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love I, him I, every I, time I yeah. see him. Yeah. I don't. Okay, I got to mention. You mentioned one actor in the crow. Is that the the drunked up uh, guy who came in? Michael that, Wincott. Yeah, that's yep. the bad guy from the crow. Right? Yes, it that's is. awesome. Yes, oh. it is. Another movie I haven't seen. You guys like mentioned The Crow a lot. The Crow's okay. actually pretty it's good. It's quite good. Fun. It's quite. It's, it's got it's, a banger of a I feel soundtrack too. Like the Crow too. has been mentioned a lot. Like yeah. maybe it's with you, but I've heard it a lot lately. I've only seen it twice. Um, and but it's just it's one of those movies that sticks with you. Yeah, I remember. It's very haunting. Uh, given also what actually happened in, behind the scenes, that's on this. You can't uh, escape that. Yeah. But just on its own is like it's riveting at times. You're just like. Yeah. This, it, with Brandon Lee it's just he's great yeah it's kind of a shame right it's like you yeah. know Brandon Lee's so good in that movie and it's like you mm -hmm. know his last big outing right? yeah and then the other it actor who I recognized and I don't think anyone has seen this show except for me um but the um the guy who came down from Chicago um who was hovering over their um the shoulders the metro and, guy yeah, yeah that John Pankow yeah that hands. guy I had seen him playing a very he, he he i think he's typecasted as a these business uh head up guys because he was he played the same role in a show called episodes mm -hmm. which is um matt leblanc's newest show where he oh, plays oh himself. yeah okay he plays a funny enough a harvey weinstein like character who mm -hmm. is the head of a studio can we he, stop name dropping? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 like, that wow. that but that actor, he's really funny. So it was nice seeing um, a smaller, uh, younger. It was like because the guy in the episodes, he's got like a big bushy beard. Mm -hmm. He's balding. So I was like, oh, I can still see some hair on your head. But uh, yeah, no, it was. Uh, yeah, it was, I. He it was, just he's just like a a, a sleazy exec kind yeah, of character. He, yeah, he's kind, kind of, of talking about that. But it was it was interesting seeing like another movie where. I recognize the entire supporting cast, but I've mm -hmm. never seen the lead actor before. It happens. Yeah. And he was, unlike, say, The Rocketeer, where mm -hmm. he, the lead actor was the least interesting character, Yeah. Uh, this time around he was the by far the most yeah. interesting character. Like, yeah. like, when it was on him, as Zach was saying, when it was in the talk show, mm -hmm. when he's actually talking, you can't take your eyes off him. Riveting. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, the whole movie does rest on his shoulders. You have to have someone who's really good or that movie doesn't work. I, I feel mm -hmm. like that happens happens with anything that goes from stage to film you have yeah. to have a guy who knows the material and who does it to a t fences F yeah exactly mm -hmm. denzel yeah. like denzel had done it on stage and right Viola there's a Davis. reason why it was yeah. so good right mm -hmm. or why his performance was so good i have my feelings about that movie but mm -hmm. um like it makes sense like this this movie you ha it has to be carried by the main actor yeah. the mm -hmm. lead actor who eats up so much dialogue right and directed it too don't forget as yeah. well, Denzel. Um, oh, sorry for fences. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll make one last uh, question. Um, 
the lead actor, you said he was in Law and Order uh, Criminal Intent. Intent. Was yeah. he the prosecutor? I've seen like no Law and Order, man. I've seen. I've only seen <laughs> SVU. I've never seen Criminal Intent. I just Intent, love. So. Dun, dun. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I only know the theme enough. song, and I've also named my left and right hands Law and Order. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's right. Chuck Norris did yeah. that with his legs. <laughs> okay, I, I, I saw one funny Chuck Norris joke recently, which was um, uh, Chuck Norris was born in a hospital that he built. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's good. I don't yeah. think it's heard right. that one. Oh, I, okay. That was the top of my head. Um, I was promoting the show um, to my Oma. Uh, on Monday mm-hmm. uh, and she's 85 years old and she, I was like do you know what a podcast is she's like no so I explained to her I was like yeah we talk about uh, underrated movies movies m- not a lot of people have seen and all that and she cuts me off and says oh, you're not watching pornography are you we sh- we could do a <laughs> spin off you know you know you yeah <laughs> sure yeah and then it was like no. <laughs> we can make yeah, this she's pornographic. Just like, she's like, it's not pornos, is it? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. That's right. No. So you know, oh, next my. week, we're we discuss Debbie Does Dallas 2. Oh, Debbie right. Does Dallas. We don't and get love together that. in our weekly Classic. Classic. viewing session. Oh. Classic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It is. Cla- that's, now that's classic. Now that's classic that, porn. That's there. classic. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Got a plot and is everything. Is this going to become a classic porn podcast? Can we change it? We'll do a spinoff with uh, with us. We'll, we'll look at it all like Deep Throat and all those movies. It'd oh, that's great. great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was the most expensive one? Was it the one based on Avatar? Pirates. Oh, shit. Yeah. It was Pirates. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact that I know that Fuck, is just I remember. Hilarious. No, well, it was newsworthy. To be fair, it was in mainstream news. My buddy had a poster of that. His My buddy's brother had a, that giant poster yeah. of that movie. And I was like, what is that? Honestly, and, like, yeah, there's that it's an interesting thing that that, that exists. Yeah. <laughs> can we can we name our can we name the show Poor No or Poor Yes? Go home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stay was... tuned for our new podcast, You Missed the Money Shot. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Ooh. I dug up. Where we cover softcore porn. Yeah. <laughs> Brad Jones. And fall asleep halfway through. <laughs> You're out of here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. Um, wh- yeah. How did we even get down this rabbit hole? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, podcasts equal porn to old people. Yeah. Yes. Is that what that right. is? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. My, the okay. whole lady is just like, my own oma. Oh just Well, like... no, because she thought <laughs> euphemism for things that pe- not a lot of people have seen was... <laughs> that that translated to pornos in her head. Again, she is eighty five. So. I think it's the opposite. Isn't porn the thing that the yeah. most people have seen? Is it the opposite of that? No one likes to admit that. <laughs> That's the difference. I mean, like the internet doesn't lie, man. Leave us a comment on the face on our Facebook page for this post and tell us if you watch porn. <laughs> we're gonna gauge. Yeah, we're gonna we're we'll have a poll. Yeah, we'll have a poll. We'll, we'll have, have a, a poll that'll be ninety percent lies and <laughs> maybe ten percent the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And we'll look at every single one of them mm-hmm. and we will make an accurate description of okay, who are liars and who are telling the truth and who are just trolls. <laughs> Law and order. Da, 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 uh, da, da. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I do want to bring up um the uh, cinematography in this film a little bit because mm-hmm. um yeah. at times it was really striking yep um he used the uh, i don't know if any of you guys know what it's called but it's the device that you put on front of a lens that helps you get two different focal lengths oh yeah i love those shots um i forget what the device is called but pretty yeah. much it's like a, it's a half lens that you put in front so that I'm in focus, and then also Zach's in focus yep. from like a big distance, and Huge they fan. use that a lot in this film. And I, it just hits me like they don't use it enough lately. It's an old school staple, it right? Really it it kind of died off. I want to say in the '90s or yeah, something. Yeah, because they did yeah. use it in like I remember Tarantino pulling that out yep. a couple times, and uh, you can see it in Reservoir Dogs and uh, Pulp Fiction. Black Christmas. Mm-hmm. Black Christmas uses a very famous one in there, yep. but that was in like in the '70s. Yep. So, but I really like that. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It almost seemed like at times there was camera mistakes in the movie, but it, to me, kind of added to the uh, frenetic energy of the talk radio show. Mm-hmm. Like there's times where the camera is like sliding back and forth mm-hmm. on the guy, mm-hmm. and nowadays I don't think you would ever see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, that that motion of going from side to side while staying straight on. That's called strafing. Yeah, so he was doing that. I think that's effective in that particular shot. Yeah, I remember like I I had done a shot like that for a short film of mine years ago. Only once though, but seeing it like used repetitively and also at appropriate times was really cool. 
Um, I liked, uh, yeah, it's just those were the two things I noticed a lot was the movement of the camera seems, I guess it's very jaded, very, um, like not, not shaky cam. Obviously it, it wasn't hard to look at, but it, you can definitely tell like everything was moving. There was rarely a time to settle down or to sit down. Yeah. And, um, which I think helped with the um, the energy of the movie. Well, that's just it. I mean, it's it's so chaotic in that booth, right? Yeah, and it, it kind of maintains the the tense. Anything can happen atmosphere. Yep. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, totally. I don't know. Like, what other shots do you think um, uh, stood out? Well, I mean, obviously the well, one that Andrew yeah. mentioned, the the, <laughs> the revolving booth was mm-hmm. so cool. Yeah. Like that was great. Yeah. And I, I like the little inserts too of like the red bulb turning on. Oh, and yeah. stuff like that for yeah. the on air stuff. I, I like that. Mm-hmm. Just the little touches. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, yeah. there's a there's a few callbacks throughout the movie that where I thought were really cool. Yeah, and it's just it, yeah, it's just it's nice seeing like Oliver Stone just seeing his directing stamp on this because mm-hmm. that's pretty much all of his movies. Uh, if you've ever watched you know his filmography, it's yeah. very uh, frenetic, very mm-hmm. the editing. Uh, actually, the editing for the most part for this film I thought was his most restrained. Yeah. Because um, for the most part, it didn't really pick up um, until like the, near the ending where it was cut, cut, cut. And this, in this uh, point, uh, it seems like each shot was kind of like it flowed into the next one. It was mm-hmm. just like putting together a train set. You know, it's like this piece fits here, this piece fits here. Not like a puzzle piece. We try to put it all together. Yeah, so it yeah. It has yeah. a nice straight line to it. Um, so that's why I think the um, the flashback scene I think really threw us all off because mm-hmm. it just. Bzz- well, that's it. It was such a left turn. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like somebody slapped a barge in the middle of the line of train cars. Yeah, and then it, but the barge just comes right back to the same spot, and then yeah. it keeps going. And then it's, yeah, uh, yeah, it was like, by the way, mm-hmm. for ten minutes, you know, yeah. like which it was just the, like, yeah. I think we all agree that the, like yeah. the points they touched on like were, were beneficial to the story, but totally. they just could have yeah. been integrated more smoothly. It wasn't yeah. necessary. Mm-hmm. You're right. Yeah. 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 No, and like like I said, the the the, the those flashback scenes were of themselves fine, but. Mm-hmm. Just how it was, yeah. Like said, just we, how it was put into, the yeah. Film, right, where like how it was inserted. They could have done it better, is what yeah, you kind yeah, of figure, right? Yeah. So you didn't like the the shot where the camera was on the ex wife, or I think it was a two shot was on it? him because they were in the park, they were talking. That's how they get to that. The camera drifts off from them up into the clouds, uh, uh, and yeah. it's almost like you had the minstrel music. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the <laughs> like the harp or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, dip, a dip to white, except they're just going into the clouds. Yeah, it and it then, felt hokey. And I then guess. it comes yeah. back the way you look at slightly it, yeah. desaturated colors. Yeah. So yeah. Nowhere yeah. In the past. Well, I was going like, to mention oh that at God. first, even because yeah. it was it was just it just kind of happened. And I was like, the colors a bit off. I noticed mm. it was yeah. like there's not enough color, and then he has his fucking hair, and it's like, oh, I'm good. glad <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned oh, that, Riley, because that was just like. That was just yeah. so stuck out so much to me. I was like, come on. Uh, <laughs> they, you know, the hair, sorry to jump in. Yeah, yeah. The hair would have been enough. The, the, hair is, <laughs> the hair is like a dumb trick that they use to say, this character is younger now, because they did that oh, with Howard that. Stern and sure. parts as well. <laughs> exactly. Like, can't yeah. they come up with someone else? Why does the hair have to be long? And yeah. speaking of the hair, when the wife walks in, and she finds out that he's been cheating. His yeah. hair is shorter at that point. Right. I think it would have made sense to keep the hair long just for the continuity of the flashback. But maybe they're saying like he's the still the same by. as he was then. Ooh. Maybe he's still, you know. I think you guys are reading too. Because the short hair, you follow yes. the hair. Maybe yeah. that's it. I he's still like the same the person as he I, was then. I do agree with, with, with um, Alex um, mentioning that, though. I think uh, in terms of just... You know, visual continuity. Yeah, to yeah. kind of keep things consistent a little bit. It was thrown a bit off. Like he could have had it a little shorter, maybe. Like mm-hmm. he's a little, you know, trimmed up, but mm-hmm. he he still maybe has the a bit of a mullet on him. Yeah, just, or, just or to he show... could have just like cut his hair after that instance because that was like a life changing thing. Usually, people change their hair after a life changing event. Well, that's what I mean. Like he he would only have the short hair in present day, mm-hmm. and then anything longer shows. It's still passed. I think what we were missing was a hair cutting montage. I think we were missing that yeah, barbershop shop taught scene. us anything. We need a montage we, of of his hair it's getting cut to be a montage. Yeah, that would have been gonna, great. I knew it was gonna hit play on Jack. So yeah, yeah. I, dude, it's, it's also in Team America. That yeah, song. exactly. Oh, it was it was in both. Oh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. that's where I know it from. <laughs> they reused it. It's Team America. I, well, like it was first in South Park. Too. Oh yeah, it, yeah, it was by like two years. So yeah. yeah, quite a bit. It was the um, Aspen it was episode. the Aspen one. Yeah, I just saw that recently in Whistler. 
which is like Canadian <laughs> Aspen. So yeah. it's pretty great. You know, uh, I, it felt very appropriate. I was getting real, uh, real happy watching that. Yeah, do French fries and pizza. I love Darsh, where they're just like, <laughs> he's just like <laughs> kicking his ass and he's just doing like French fries, pizza, French fries, pizza, and like barely getting down the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty great. The whole... South Park. Yeah. Lots of fun. Great anyway, show. Talk um, radio. Yeah. So talk radio. Uh, no, I, I agree with what you guys are saying, though. Like, th- I think the hair, it didn't really matter that much. I think there were more problems with that flashback than the hair. But but, he, but he's right, though, for continuity. You sure. Have had, yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Keep the hair long. It's like it's like still a flashback. Same length. Yeah, yeah, because I would believe that, okay, after they get divorced, that's when he would cut his yeah. hair. Yeah. Because he'd be like, holy, like, this is this is really traumatic. Mm-hmm. Cut my hair. And it's also been some time, too. That, like too. That, There's a that that bigger well. gap in yeah. time than there was between... Uh, like the beginning part of that flashback yeah. and the end. So yeah. I agree with that. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what? I mean, that's a nitpick at the end of the day. I think that's like a little nitpicky. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little nitpicky, but it's also a potential error that we like all kind of spotted. So it's a little yeah. more significant than, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. know, you never know. It could have been, it, didn't uh, it could have been intentional. It could have been a reshoot. It could have been. Too. I noticed yeah. it. I noticed it, but it didn't draw my attention that much. Like I, unless you guys had started talking, because you guys started talking about it now is why it sticks out more. But it didn't stick out that much to me when I was watching it. Like I just noticed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah, barely. Yeah, so. actually, another um, repeated uh, shot that they used. Actually, probably the most. I don't know why I didn't start with this one. Was the glass reflecting? Yes. Uh, showing both. Uh, mm. You see both their faces with that. So that saves so much time on coverage because if yeah. you say wanted like that shot where he's just staring at his producer and puts his finger on the window yeah like a lot of that was played in one shot mm-hmm. because you could see her reflection in the in the glass and yeah i loved a lot of those where someone would walk into the light and they would illuminate and then they would come back yeah um, like a lot of those different setups i thought were really effective yeah my favorite one was the one in the climax where the wife was calling yeah and, and it's just as you see him kind of turn and just kind of like you know, drop the whole thing. Like her reflection just gets darker and darker and darker, and then disappears. That's it's just him. That's another uh, aspect of the stage play. Yes, because that was when, a good symbolic moment. When yeah. there are two characters yeah. on the stage, and especially in a dialogue like that, it'll mm-hmm. fade off from one. Mm-hmm. So then you leave the other on the stage, and that's exactly what that was exactly. doing. Exactly, and yeah. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the lighting cues were uh, were very much of the of the theater. You know, mm-hmm. the dimming down and coming back up, just yeah. like a monologue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, once uh, once you, it was established, this was based at, at a, adapted from a play, as Andrew said. Then it, everything kind of clicked more. You're like, oh okay, yeah okay okay okay. So yeah, it was nice seeing Al, uh, uh, <laughs> Alec Baldwin can still play this. He has played that same character. Yeah, he has that stock. <laughs> I'm I'm the boss, and you're gonna listen to me. You could stuff. have spliced in that closing speech from Glenn Gary Glen Glenn Ross somewhere in there, and I don't think we would have noticed. No, I think that's what probably could have helped get land in that role because he he just sells being executive so well. Like you watch Thirty Rock, and oh he's yeah. Just born to, say, yeah, he's born to play that role or whatever else. Uh, no, I done. think he was born to play boss, baby. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> exactly, right. Exactly. Sorry, man. He he's not just like any kind of boss. He's a He's a better as a baby. No matter what age. I think they're making a sequel to that. You're kidding. They are. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Boss Babies? It was successful. It did well at the box office. Oh, I didn't it did. know that. No, it did. Yeah, it underrated. Did. <laughs> 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 Trying to keep ourselves going already, I see. Yeah, that's right. You guys don't know what my pick is. Boy, the bottom of the barrel came up fast. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know we were already there. Well, shit. <laughs> we're going to talk about overrated movies. <laughs> we yeah. ran out of underrated movies. This is it. Ten episodes. Yeah, done. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, Which I think we are legitimately. I'm yeah, not I think sure. we're coming, we're coming I feel like we've ends, covered it. I yeah, think. like... Uh... For the most part, there. I wanted to mention, like I like to do the the musical score. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't notice it much. I, no? I'll be perfectly okay. honest. Yeah. I didn't really notice it either. I yeah. noticed the songs way more than... Uh, I thought those were more effectively used than the score. I noticed the, the ads more than the score. Yeah. I mean, yeah. was, whenever the ads were playing, I was like, yeah, I was like totally into that. Yeah, actually, yeah the pizza one and all that were, were really funny and just like how you would cut back and forth. But yeah, besides like, you know, during the quieter moments, which is probably why they didn't stick out to me. The, the, the score didn't stick out, mm. I guess, for all of us didn't too much yeah. because we were so invested with the dialogue that we didn't really need music a majority of the time to kind of 
push the uh, the emotion. Well, bit. and again, being based on a uh, theatrical play, right? There's a there's a reason why you don't really notice music at that as much because the the focus is always heavy on the on the dialogue. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So like that makes sense to me. Like again, it, that context makes it it adds a lot of context. The fact that that you told me that because I didn't know until you'd mentioned it. And everything just clicked. So, like, mm. that's another element where I'm like, oh, it makes sense that I didn't notice the score as much. Okay. Because the same thing with Fences. Like, I could not tell you what the score was like in that movie from a year ago. Because I don't remember. Dramatic, I suppose. Because dramatic shit happened in that. Uh, <laughs> I, re- I remember the score, I think, a little more. But, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> subdued. It is like that in It's Fences. pretty subdued. I, I don't. Like, majority of the time, I feel like nothing's this, happening. The score and is so Denzel the same, same yelling. Same with this one, right? It's like. It's pretty I, subtle. I, it's so subtle that I, I barely noticed mm. it. Yeah, only thing music-wise that I noticed that was the obvious one when he would sign off on the show and the music would play Mad out. Kind of like well, what we do on a yeah. podcast. Well, that's, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's an obvious one. But, yeah, in terms of the score, it was like... I feel but, like yeah. for me in the quieter moments of the film, I was like trying to process everything that I had like, just heard. So yeah. for maybe for that reason, the score didn't really stick out to me at all during the course of the movie yeah like um like these guys were saying with the some of like the, the commercials and like the little musical interludes in the show yeah but not some not so much the the underlying score like i feel the um the, the performances obviously but also just the the lighting and the camera um did a lot more to, for um atmosphere than the score did for mm-hmm. for me at least unless you're talking about the score being settled at the end of the movie when the guy shoots barry i'm goes, i'm gonna say i'm settling the score <laughs> so I, i'm gonna say that uh i think we're breaking alex's heart i think he actually <laughs> secretly loves the score and that he has it on cassette and plays it in his car <laughs> <laughs> like not no cd he has it on cassette no he has the top <laughs> radio sessions he just listens to the radio play from the movie he's just like yeah who did the score in. for this movie yeah. his name is Stuart copeland what else has he done oh please prior to this he what? did music for the tv series the equalizer from 1985 to 1987 which is why i think at times the soundtrack sounded like it was best suited for a tv movie however that's my only criticism of it i think that at times it really helped out with the atmosphere mm-hmm. and at times it probably didn't need to be used as much but then again it it, it fit really well i think with the movie for the most part mm-hmm. so, well all good scores really are like that where it, it it's john carpenter put it best you know a score has got to be like a carpet you notice it at first but eventually you forget about it because it, 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 it supports the whole floor yeah yeah um so i think in this case yeah it definitely it did its job like it didn't stand out in a negative way it didn't stand out in a I want to listen to this on its own. It was no injustice for all. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't no injustice for all. It wasn't uh, Little Prince, which had some fantastic music. Um, See, I, I was gonna say like not noticing a score. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Just uh-huh. because, like, I sure it depends on the film. Because it really I does. Feel like, like there are so many films I can think of where without that score, like I don't know how what like I know I would have enjoyed the film. But it, noticing it was important while I was watching that. Oh, like, absolutely! I, I get, like a Wars. lot of Hans Zimmer scores, to be honest. Like yep. I feel like a lot of the ones that I can think of, especially a lot of the Nolan stuff. Like if it was absent, like there were times where it needed to be absent, like mm-hmm. in Rises where uh, he just cut it for a complete fight sequence. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's good shit like that, but uh, you know, I feel like it adds so it can add so much, right? Mm-hmm. You're gonna notice it frequently, mm-hmm. um, but not all. You're right, not all the time. Like mm-hmm. then it's. Re- getting a little out of hand yeah if it if it, if it calls attention to itself and but that sometimes it should right like if it matches the film like yes. a one that i came to mind immediately because uh, i don't know why i guess like I, I like the dark knight rises score quite a bit yeah but where he's coming out of the pit and the chanting and everything and where the score comes to a crescendo mm-hmm. like that's awesome but that draws so much attention to itself right mm-hmm. like it's like if you're in i like imax like i was you notice it more than like almost anything else because it's just pounding mm-hmm. yeah well i was right. about to say too what a funny thing for john carpenter to say because i find yeah, his scores so stand out like yeah. oh the score is on now like yeah. even every like time you listen to, every time you watch <laughs> halloween it's like yeah. oh there's yeah, the score yeah. like mm-hmm. you even might mention i think that's more of a, from new york certain motifs but in, in terms of like the overall 
score of them like the whole thing yeah like the how it structures you're always going to have uh uh familiar callbacks just like that the in the scene dark knight rises you're talking about we've heard uh with the addition of the the chant but we've heard that type of that music callback throughout all three movies yes so we're familiar with it because um as you said it's 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 the theme for the movie and yes each score how it um it depends on the movie Mm -hmm. if it's an action superhero movie we're going to remember certain callbacks uh, themes like the Terminator mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Like that's what they're designed for. But for a film like this, you just need something because the focus is purely on dialogue. It's oh, yeah. purely on visuals in terms of the camera. It didn't need um, a score to call attention to itself. Um, so that's why I think it uh, it did its job. Um, but. Like I said, I don't think it's a knack that you didn't really notice it. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, not at all. No, yeah. I don't think that's a knock. On no. no. I think it's worse um, if it's really bad and you notice it. Yeah. Like that, Injustice and for that's All. Injustice exactly. for All or another movie. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the music from Commando either. Or uh, the remake of uh, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, honestly. Yeah. Like just, just a bit uh, much. I still need to see the originals. Of the They're good. I, I have them all. They I haven't awesome. seen the remake, so I... Uh, I did not mm-hmm. like the remake. There's I don't a... like Rooney Mara either. That's a big part of it. Yeah. But... So I saw the remake really? and like I thought it was okay, but I have nothing to compare it to except the books. Yeah, yeah, and the books are great. Books are fantastic. The original yeah. film is quite good. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it's one of my favorites. Yeah, but yeah, I think uh, like like all of the general feel at this table is uh, like most of us liked it. Yeah, like, thought it was. I, I think a lot of us would say it's underrated. It mm-hmm. deserved. Better than not making its budget, I would say. Absolutely. And I want to go yeah. back to like something that Jack said, like near the beginning about how it, how despite being made in 1988, it still I think provides a pretty good representation of our, our kind of relationship with the media even these days. Nothing's changed. I feel like nice. we say that. Like a if you've lot ever ventured, show. yeah, but like if you've yeah. ever but ventured keeps, into like an internet up. comments forum anywhere, like. You can you can kind of see and and and, you, and we see elements such as like people who purport to be fans of the show completely missing the point of the show and thinking like it's just a big game and he's just joking around like that mm. the the goofball kid who appears on the show he thinks is thinks Barry's just like the greatest guy just like yeah. fucking around fucking with very, everyone. He's a very like '70s kind of like archetype. I feel like where it's just like yeah, everything's a party, whatever, right? Yes, yeah, like, so, like he mentality. claims to appreciate the show, but he actually has no understanding of what the motivations of the yeah. show's creator are. And then also, and then of course you have the people who hate the show but they also can't adequately express why they don't like the show and so they just go to attacking the host instead you know calling him a jew and a faggot and sending him death threats and oh, stuff yeah, because you know crazy. that's that's yeah. how we have that, that that's people's idea of discourse these days is just is shooting the messenger as opposed sure. to addressing the actual issue yeah mm-hmm. I, I feel like here's the thing is that i feel like a lot of these issues are are everlasting a lot of these issues go back much further than 20 years, 30 years. Mm-hmm. A lot of these issues are, are inherent in in parts of human nature, in mm-hmm. the way that we react to things, react to things we don't like, react to things we like. Like everybody, I, I feel like these reactions are, are kind of inherent. It's how you learn to deal with them. People get better at learning to deal with them. But I feel like in regards to these issues, they're, they're, constant issues i don't yeah. think they'll ever go away no I, I, I feel like you just work on them so it'll always like stuff like this will always be relevant like, yeah in another 20 years i bet you this movie will have relevant ta- uh, aspects that mm-hmm. that we'll be able to pick up on because things won't have changed that much mm-hmm. yeah no i totally agree with what you're saying and like watching this kind of made me realize it's like okay yeah. we have like we have current events yeah. there's always been that but the way that we've dealt with it has not has not changed very much for in every that time, events. despite everything that's Always. happened to us over the decades. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I guess we're sure. slow learners. Maybe that's the moral of the story. Yeah, I think we're we're doomed to to repeat things, and and you know, I mean, with maybe bits of improvement each time, but I, I feel like things just don't go away. No, be a pessimist to be kind of a pessimist, but I mean, yeah, I I think it's hard to to think that we can fix it, it's too optimistic to think that we can fix these things mm. oh yeah absolutely mm. it's, it's unrealistic because yeah. there's so but many you variables. individually can do the best that you can do absolutely. which i think is what people need forget and they just feel so like in context of the show like what he was saying like you know you you people get angry about how messed up the world is and you just start 
you know, reacting a certain way, whether it's this way or that way. But the best way to react is to to better yourself, mm-hmm. is to just focus on yourself because... Because that's all you can do. That's all you really can do, yeah. You can try to make as much of an impact you personally can. Yeah, and I think that in the end, that's a, a good hallmark for this movie because yeah. it helps keeps it timeless. It's not just an 80s movie. Like, no. besides the haircuts, I would... <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. This movie can take place almost at any time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I think is great. And Well, except for the fact that I feel like talk radio might not be relevant. Talk and podcast. It would have to be a podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> You'd have to just, like, pretend it was a podcast. Yeah. There always yeah. will be a, a talking mouth on a mic. Yeah. That will never go away. There yeah. always will be someone talking. And there will always be people to comment on it, whether it's yes. YouTube comments. It's There's always going to be that audience participation element as yep. well. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll... We might as well wrap it up if there's no other straggling comments waiting in the wings. Going once, going twice. Jack, final thoughts on the film. Why Jack? Why not? He's going, he's going back in a circle. Even man. though I didn't look at Jack when I said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, don't you mean Zach? Yeah, I this is the part where he docks oh, well. Jack. <laughs> yeah uh, but overall um out of all the oliver stone movies that i have seen i think this is a lot better than his more some of his more famous ones i think this is definitely better than uh w i think this is better than in any given sunday um i think any given, any given sunday is eh, it's not really that good at all so uh, that's going to be my next pick for a film. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll 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 gladly revisit it and, and we'll go toe to toe. Tear a new one. Yeah. Watch yeah. it on a Sunday. <laughs> I'd be oh, God. Uh, I'd be interested to know if you liked it better than Wall Street, though. Yeah, I, I still need to see Wall Street. Uh, definitely. And Platoon. I've seen Platoon. Yeah. Do, Platoon. You, do you like it better than Platoon? Oh yeah, good question. Um, I might. Really. Wow. Um. Just because I feel like there's a lot more I can take from this movie than okay. I can with Platoon. Um, though I really do need to see Platoon again. It was one time like five years ago. Platoon's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like, it I, is a, I, I think that movie is just so good. Yeah, yeah, I do think Platoon is a solid movie, but my favorite JFK... Uh, sorry, my favorite... <laughs> my favorite <laughs> What's spoiler? your favorite JFK movie? <laughs> uh, no, my favorite Oliver Stone movie is has always been JFK. I think sure. that's... And I think that's... That's one of the best. And that, sure. I think that goes around all around from with a lot of people that... Well, again, whether you agree or disagree with the subject matter, as a as a filmmaking as a piece of filmmaking and the craft of filmmaking, it is solid. Mm-hmm. It is Oliver Stone at his peak, I think. And he, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I like Natural Born Killers a lot too, despite oh, what shit. despite what Tarantino yeah. thinks. I I think that is a great movie yeah. as well. Oh man, I haven't seen Natural Born Killers. It's yet. very good. It's oh, on my it's on my list to yes. go see it though. So Dude. yeah, I I would say that was probably his peak. Uh, it was around the same time. It, though, it was, it, yeah, it was. It was around yeah. the, it, it, those two movies yeah. were like three years apart. So yeah, it was like the early that. '90s was his his kind of peak years, and then after yeah. Natural Born Killers, he did Nixon, right, which didn't do well. Yeah, but it was still you know he's doing a movie about Nixon. So yeah. yeah. Um, but anyways, overall, um, I enjoyed the movie. I do mm-hmm. think it's underrated, and uh, if you're a fan of Oliver Stone or just uh, talk radio in general, just uh, yeah, go check it out. Nice, Ryland. Um, yeah, okay, you guys are flinging around all these movie titles. I have, I'm not really familiar uh, no, with I'm the, in with you. Trust <laughs> with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here course. like, haven't seen it, haven't seen it, haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so disp- d- especially not being an Oliver Stone uh, aficionado, I definitely really like this film. Um, lots of food for thought, and I would say it's uh, it's underrated. It's lo- There's uh, lots of great talking points. Um, great, uh, great writing, great performance by the lead actor. Um, and I mean, and the supporting uh, cast as well, but especially lead actor, and um, and great atmosphere as well. Um, yeah, and I guess the the what the movie tries to impart is that they'll be they'll always be they'll always be talkers and they'll always be listeners. And the, one of the lines that kind of resonated with me at the very end is the is Barry's quoting us that we're stuck with each other. Mm-hmm. There's, there's always going to be, there's always going to be that, uh, that relationship. Pretty That's cool. Right. <laughs> that dead air radio part was actually really solid. That yes. Was, mm-hmm. It was silent. It was like, this is great. Well, so they had, they'd had a bunch of like just close ups with like his mouth and the, and the microphone before. And then mm-hmm. this one, they kind of did that same thing, but they, 
they had the camera just a little bit further back so you could kind of see his whole profile with the look mm-hmm. in his eyes and everything and yeah that was that was some pretty intense stuff and that's something you're not going to get the most effect of in a stage play which is why a shot like that after all that talking throughout the film mm-hmm. works so well definitely yeah, exactly that, like that was great that's moment utilizing your medium there it was a, mo- it was a weird moment of silence in a film that has none yeah 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 Effective. Yeah. Mr. Dad Jokes, what do you think? Dad, Dad jokes. Mr. Dad Joke here. <laughs> I think we I think that's his radio name, Dad Jokes. Dad, Dad, Dad Jokes Dad Live. Jokes. Dad Jokes Live. <laughs> Here's Daddy. Oh no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you asked for it, Andrew. Come on. <laughs> Damn, this could be a thing. It's awful. Um, like you, you, let's scrap you, that idea. But you talk man. about having a soundboard. You sit next to him. He's going to hit that soundboard more than you ever will. Yeah, yeah actually, that's will. a very good that's, point. I can't keep my hands bad. off it. Yeah, he is like a kid that way. Yeah, yeah I mean, give me a... Dad you know, jokes, but child's hands, honestly. I mean, even give me a Fisher-Price, you know, toy, you know, or something that yeah, makes all the different fidgety, noises. Man. I'll make it work. That squeaky shark you had, man. God damn I still it. got it. I know you do. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I echo a little, what a lot of people said here already. I mean, it's 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 definitely underrated. It's it's a solid film. Um, I like how it mainly takes place, you know, just in a booth and things like that. It almost adds even a little bit of claustrophobia at times with like the issues with just him and this unknown caller and just some of like the really crazy stuff he has to listen to and kind of deal with. Um, it, it it's probably a little similar to like I guess what some of like the nine eleven like operators deal with and stuff. Like, not quite the same, but a little bit yeah. um, that they have to deal with, you know, day in, day out, except that they can't joke it off and stuff like that. So, and they can't hang up on And people. they can't hang up on them either. <laughs> oh, okay. not. Sorry, but, like, you completely lost me there for a second because you said 9 11 operators. Yeah, you're, you're missing and I was 9 like, 1 1. Yeah. Whoa, dude. I was like, I'm trying to make some connection here. And I was like, I, I don't understand. No, it's the same numbers. No, it's I, the same I, I, numbers. I caught on to he just, It took me till yeah. just like. Five seconds in to realize, oh wait, he's talking about. We're, we're, we're talking conspiracies now, and this is a different Oliver Stone yeah. movie. Yeah, <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, we're talking. We're talking about that film now. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Overall, it was it was really solid, and uh, I liked that there was uh, there's a lot of talking and there's a lot of radio. <laughs> they didn't disappoint on those two, so yeah <laughs> yeah buddy okay dad jokes um <laughs> andrew final feelings on the film well it i feel like this film is very underrated i agree that it's underrated and i feel like i had a good time the feelings were strong the feelings of feel were very strong during this film so Honestly, it's a feel-good film in a way, but not really. So don't actually go see it if you want a feel-good film. Like seriously, don't. Um, I, no, I, you know what? Like everybody said, it was it was a really, uh, it, it was it was solid. It deserved. I think it deserved to to do well. It's too bad it didn't. Uh, I think definitely if you get a chance to watch this, you should. If it pops up on Netflix, if you get an opportunity to watch it you should uh, I, I think it's one of the better movies we've we've seen so far actually and uh i haven't seen much oliver stone so i don't have a point of comparison really besides platoon and wall street yeah um, but those are two really damn good ones and yep. i think it hangs it hangs with them to be honest it can hang with them so i agree i think that's that's a that's quite a bit of praise to put on it so good pick alex thank you and as for my thoughts on the film i liked it <laughs> that's why i brought it in i i think for being such a small film nestled in the bigger films in oliver stone's catalog i think this one was was it should have been bigger like i really like you said it should have made more than its budget i think it's a really good film i'm i'm so glad that you all liked it thank you very much for taking the time mm-hmm. with me to watch it and Many, many thanks to Eric Bogosian, the great lead actor. He's done a lot of things since then. The the great performance by Michael Wincott, who was mm-hmm. probably Sean Penn's answer. What was that that stoner role that Sean Penn had? Spicoli. Yeah. yeah, Spicoli, so yeah. That's his answer, answer to Spicoli. It was great to see a young Alec Baldwin. Mm-hmm. And you should go see it, all of you who are listening. 
So please do leave us a comments on SoundCloud, email us with questions and or suggestions, or you can mail directly to Jack's home no. a dead do rat it, wrapped it, in a Nazi it. flag. Send it. Send no. it. Send it. <laughs> yeah. That's the last mail thing in a big I box. That's right. Put it in a paper dead bag. Ro- dead rodent. That's we'll, right. Yeah. We'll have his address on the Facebook page. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> link, links up there. Yeah. On behalf of Jack, Ryland, Zach, Andrew, and myself, thank you very much for listening. This is Alex for the You Missed It podcast signing off, and I can't wait to get shot for having a political opinion different than yours. <laughs>